I'm really excited about our upcoming season here at LBC because we're beginning a space called Be Rich. Now, Be Rich is an annual generosity campaign that has its origin somewhere else, but that we are adopting here. And my hope is that over this coming few weeks, as we prepare our hearts to be generous to our community, that it will be an amazing opportunity to extend ourselves in generosity as we already do as a church. Now, I don't know if you keep up to date with sort of where Australia is in terms of its generosity, but I love looking at the stats around like, you know, how much do people actually give? And what you'll be surprised to learn if you've never looked into it before is that within the Australian context, um, the reports show us that the people who are the most generous are the people who earn the least in terms of a percentage of their income. And what you find is that Australians, on average, in the lower income earner bracket, they generally uh, are giving between about 1.9 and 2.4% of their income away, which is quite good. Um, the fact that, you know, the messaging in our culture is it's all for you. Um, the fact that people give anything away, I think, is a win. But as people earn more and more money, what you'd think would happen is that they wouldn't need as much, so they would have more to give away, but what you find is the opposite. By the time you get towards the high-earning people, it actually drops below 1% of their giving away. And what's awesome is that when you look at church, churches and people that go to church or that have a religious background, they tend to be more generous than those that don't. So what we get to do within our context here is we get to talk about money in a way that says it's not just for me, it's something that can equip and can be extended to our community. The same way that it comes to community service, the way that we can use our time, our effort and our attention, not just for me. And in fact, what I think is at the heart of Jesus' message, and I've said this again, uh, I've said this before, I'll say it again, is this whole idea that Jesus came to serve others, right? That's what he said, I came not to be served, but to serve. So for those of us that say, I love Jesus, we get to serve other people, and we get to do that with our time, our attention, and our finances. And Be Rich is basically focusing in on that and giving us a little bit of a pointy end to say, how can we love our community generously? And that's what we're going to be exploring today. But before I get into that, let me just quickly pray for our time together. Lord God, you know everything, which is awesome and great, and there's so many stories in this room and who are listening online, God, that you hold all of us in your mind and in your heart. And this morning, my prayer is just simply help us apply what we need to apply. Help us take away what we need to take away and just let anything else that's a distraction be removed. In your name and for your glory. Amen. Amen. All right. So I want to start today with a quick question, and you can answer in your minds. Please don't answer out loud. Um, what is it that you think when you think about church and the early church? You may not have thought about the early church ever, and that's absolutely fine. The early church is just that beginning time when Jesus died, rose again, and people started gathering together to say, this is important. That period of time, that first couple hundred years, when you think back to that first initial moments 2,000 years ago, back in those first couple hundred years, why do you think it was successful? Like, why, why do you think that people continued it? I can understand the people who were originally there when Jesus died and rose again and they saw something they couldn't explain. I get why they believed it, but why did it keep going? Like, why is it that the church kept growing? Why is it the church kept moving? Why is it that 2,000 years ago, it wasn't just one man came to the earth, died, rose again, so they say, and then it should have been the end after one generation, right? Why is it that it kept moving? Why did the movement keep going? Now, a lot of people will try to answer that and say, oh, I think back then, uh, people just wanted something to believe in. The world was not as hopeful as it may have been right now um, for those of us alive. Uh, we are in the best moment in terms of a global perspective of human history. We have the least amount of suffering, the most um, amount of, of um, finances available to people. People think that we're declining. All the indicators on a worldwide scale actually show that we're getting better. Technology is helping with stuff, even though it doesn't feel that way at times. Just that's what's going on. But back then, people go, well, they needed something to hope on. They needed something to... To, to, to just go, oh, I need something to go beyond myself. And that, that might be a reason. Some people say that the early church succeeded because it was such a compelling story. Like the underdog, one man up against this big machine, and he overcame all odds, including death, to take home the victory. So maybe it was that sort of like thing within us that wants the, wants the story to be good. Or maybe the early church succeeded because it was always going to succeed, and they just needed the right foundation. And when Jesus came along and gave that right foundation, people started saying, this is amazing, we're going to start doing this. Now, I'm not a historian, 
and I wasn't alive to witness anything. But what I think happened all those years ago, in those first moments, those first couple of generations of this message of Jesus growing, what I think that actually happened on the ground, boots on the ground, is that people who say they followed Jesus did things differently. They lived differently. They were generous. They were willing to do things that people at the time weren't willing to do. And what we see in the, in the rounds of history is that people said that they loved Jesus, that they followed Jesus. They were extremely kind, compassionate, caring in a world where you didn't need to be. If you were on top, you could stay on top. If you were at the bottom, you didn't want to know about anything else. But these people who said they loved Jesus, they were doing things that people just didn't do at the time. They were taking in children that were being left out to die because they weren't wanted children. And they would take those children in and add them to their family. And it was a risk to them because they had another mouth to feed. They have another person in the family. But it's what they did. Not because the Bible said they had to do it. Not because that's what was dictated to them. They just looked around and said, if Jesus loves me, I need to love others. And when they did that, people saw that generosity. They saw that new way of living. And I think that's what gave the movement, the momentum that initially happened in those first couple of hundred of years. This group of first century believers had the audacity to actually apply the teachings of Jesus, contextualize it to themselves and say, this is what we heard Jesus say. This is what we saw Jesus do. And now we're going to take that and do that in our moment. And now 2,000 years later, you and I, we get an opportunity to do the same thing. How did Jesus live? What did Jesus say? What did Jesus do? And we get to take that and apply that to our lives today. And we get to live differently. For some of you, the reason that you're even in church or the reason you're even here today is because at some point in your life, someone in your life showed you that there is a different way to live and that they loved Jesus. For some of you, you're here because you have to be. Uh, maybe someone dragged you along, don't look at them. Um, and you're just here because of that. Glad you're here with us. Hopefully today encourages you. Because I think that everyone who says that they love Jesus should live this way and should be generous in all that they have. So we're going to have a look today at how we can engage in the generosity. How we can apply what Jesus asks us to do. And we're going to be doing that through um, a guy named Paul today. So... We're going to be talking about this series, Be Rich. Now, the question you might be having in your mind is, why do we call it Be Rich? And we're going to have a look at a Bible passage which has it in it to explain it. Because it's quite a confronting name. Like, what does it mean to be rich? Does that mean I should be rich? Like, I should have more money? Um, that's not what it means. Um, if you happen to be rich, that's great. Um, but Be Rich is actually something that we get from a guy named Paul. So, as I said earlier, the early church started growing. The main reason that the early church started growing was because this guy named Paul. Paul was a man who lived 2,000 years ago. He really, really loved God to the point where he went around trying to get these people who were Christians, who were Jesus followers. He's trying to say, that's not what God wants. So he went and tried to remove them. And then suddenly he actually met Jesus, had a complete 180. He went, uh, actually, no, Jesus is the Son of God. He really is um, speaking on behalf of God. And he completely changed his life. He went from persecuting, from going up against, from trying to destroy the Christian faith, to building it up church by church, location by location. So Paul was going around in his first um, years of the church, going around telling people, have you met Jesus? Or you haven't? Let me tell you about Jesus. He is God's son. He came to earth. He showed us what we should do to follow, Jesus, to follow God. And then he died, but he didn't stay dead. He rose again. And if you want to live, not just now, but for eternity, you've got to follow him. And Paul went from town to town preaching this message. Sometimes the people embraced it and went, yes. Other times they were resistant to it. Sometimes he had a lot of success and sometimes he didn't. And what happened is that Paul would go around, he would meet this church, he would build them up, say, keep your eyes on Jesus, then he would leave. And this group of people said, we've got to keep our eyes on Jesus, got to keep our eyes on Jesus. But what if we add, and then they start to do other things. And then Paul's over here in a different location, so he's going, how do I reach them to say, you're sort of missing some things. So he started to write letters and he started to address these to different churches to say, hey, remember what I called you to do. You got a bit distracted. I'm going to write a letter. I'm going to send someone to you. And he was just trying to keep track. So like a good parent keeps track of their children. Like just trying to keep track. Where, where are things at? What's happening? So during one of these times, uh, when he is writing his letters, he meets a young church guy um, named Tim. 
um, Timothy, and he just loves Timothy so much. Like he, he, he invests in Timothy. He sees this young leader start to emerge and goes, this guy gets it, and he wants to support him. So he writes a letter to Timothy, and he uh, writes a couple, and he, and he encourages him. And it's actually from this letter. Um, if you've got your Bible, you can go to 1 Timothy 6. Otherwise, it'll be up on the screen. It's from this part of the Bible that we get this idea around be rich. So this is what's happening. Paul is there writing to a young leader, encouraging him, trying to tell him what he should be getting up to. So this is what he says in 1 Timothy 6, 17. He says, Command those who are rich in this present world not to be arrogant, nor to put their hope in wealth, which is so uncertain. Which, I mean, so Timothy is a young leader within the church, and he gets this letter from Paul, and he's like, I've got to listen to Paul. Paul's met Jesus all this sort of stuff, and, and he reads, command those who are rich in this present world. That's a lot of pressure on the poor guy, right? Okay, those who are rich in this present world. What he means is those who have money right now, go and don't just tell them. He uses the word command. So he's saying, don't just go and say, excuse me, would you consider? He's saying, no, Tim, you're the one in charge. Go to them and say, hey, don't be arrogant and don't put your hope in the wealth that you have. There's something better. He says, put their hope in God. So don't put your hope in wealth. And you can understand, like, we get this as where we sit. If you've got some financial um, means in your life, what happens when you don't earn a lot of money is you have a lot of hope in, in God, in friends, in community. And then as you start to earn a little bit more, you create a bit of a buffer. And before you know it, you start to go, I don't need the community so much. I may not need God so much because if that breaks, insurance will cover it. If that breaks, I'll buy a new one. If that, don't put your hope in the possessions. But actually, you need to... Put your hope in God, who richly provides us with everything for our enjoyment. And I love that phrase, who richly provides everything for our enjoyment. Because I think sometimes, especially when we talk about money, and I love talking about money, but I know some people aren't comfortable with that. God has given us everything we need and everything that we need for our enjoyment. We get to find joy in it. When we put our hope and our trust in the riches and when we think that that's what's going to provide us the safety and everything... That's not helpful. But when we put our trust in God, he provides us with what we need to enjoy this life. He goes on. Command them to do good. All right, you've got a lot. You need to do good. To be rich, which is where we get this phrase from. To be rich in good deeds and to be generous and willing to share. In this way, they will lay up treasure for themselves as a firm foundation for the coming age so that they may take a hold of this life that is truly life. I've talked about this before and we're going to tackle this as well later this year um, before Christmas. Um, Our finances can be something that we put our trust in and our hope in or they can become an opportunity to invest in people's lives. And I tell you, when we get to the end of our life, when we get to the next generation, they're not going to remember many things about us. But when we can be generous to them, when we can use our current resources to invest in people, to love people, to build people up, that's what's going to last. I believe one day, um, hopefully, God willing, I get to heaven and I'm there and I get to see people that my generosity actually led to discover God for themselves. Because I gave my time, because I gave my money, because I invested in that relationship, those people, those things, those organizations were able to use that resource to bless, to help, to help other people. And one day I hope to meet many people in heaven. I hope to get to have community with many people because I was a good steward of what I was given to have. So Paul is saying to Tim, there's people in your context that have money. And the temptation for them is going to be to put their trust and faith in their money. Now, fast forward to us 2,000 years later. I don't think a lot has changed. I think it's exactly the same. There's people in our life and in our world right now where if I was to say to them, what is the thing that brings you certainty and security? And a lot of people will say that they are financially good. There's a song which has, uh, I can't remember which song it is, but it has this great line in it. And he talk, it, the, the rapper's talking about where he came from to where he is now. And the line he uses, you know you're good when you don't have to look at the receipt. 
Like, so when you're buying stuff, you don't even have to look at the receipt, you don't even have to check the till. Like, you just, you just put the card down and you just pay. And, you, and sometimes, uh, I'm guilty of it, I'll go to the shops and I'm like, I don't even know how much that just cost. I saw what I needed, I bought what I needed. I didn't even give it a second thought. There's a lot in our life where I think people go, I am secure, I am safe, I am protected because I know I have enough. But Paul, who has an eternal perspective... Paul, who understands that God is not just interested in your current version of happiness. Paul, who walked around, who met Jesus, who talked to all people from all sorts of backgrounds, when I know it's tempting to put your faith, your trust, and your security into your finances, but trust me, that's not going to get you where you want to go. And the cure for it, the cure for this misputting of trust is not to just try and run away from it. It's actually to be generous with it, to put your trust into God, to to recognize that what you have in your hands is something to be utilized for the people around you. So we're to be good, we're to be rich in good deeds, we're to put our hope in God so that those of us who are rich in this world may love people in this world as Jesus Christ has loved us. Now, it may be tempting for you to go, all right, Josh, I get that, but I'm not rich in this world. I get that. I remember when I was, um, I was listening to a sermon when I was um, 19 years old. I just entered Bible college, and the preacher was talking about a um, similar passage, but saying, those of you who are rich, and I thought to myself, i got 30 bucks in the bank account. I'm not rich. And it can be very tempting to sort of say, well, thank goodness, that excludes me from this whole generosity stuff. I'm just going to look after me and uh, make sure that I have what I need. I'm not rich in this world. Um, The problem is, uh, if you earn more than $16,000 a year, did you know, um, if you earn more than $16,000 a year um, annually, Australian dollars, you're in the top 50% of earners in the world. And if you were unaware, back in 2022, we passed the 8 billion mark. Uh, So which means, if you earn more than $16,000 um, you are richer than 50%, which is 4 billion people. You earn more than 4 billion people. The mind boggles at that, right? Like we can barely contain thinking about 100 people, 1,000 people. More than 4 billion people earn less than 16,000 Australian a year. Now, the reason you don't feel rich, right? The reason you and I don't feel rich is normally because we're not thinking globally, we're thinking locally. And you don't feel rich because you look at your house and you look at your kitchen and your pool, if you have a pool, or your backyard, and you go, it's nice, but have you seen? You know? I know I have this much in my pension, but do you know about? And what happens is the reason we don't feel rich, even though for, in a global context we are rich, the reason we don't feel rich is because we end up living in the land of Ur. Because in the land of Ur, when we compare ourselves to other people, there's always someone richer, there's always someone that has the thing that's bigger, shinier, skinnier, newer, faster. When we start to compare to one another, it can be very easy to go, that's not me. I'm not rich because the people I hang out with, they're rich. And I'm sure they're thinking to themselves, I'm not rich, they're rich. And we're all pointing at each other going, but look at your car, but look at your house, but look at what you earn, but look, da 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 And it can be so easy to lull ourselves into this idea that when I am rich, then I'm going to be generous. And Paul, you're talking to Timothy and you're saying, for, command those who are rich in this world to not put their trust in their riches. But Paul, I'm not rich. But when I am, I promise I'll be generous. And that's a trap. It's a complete trap. As I said at the beginning of the message, like most generosity in a percentage of income-wise is done by those who earn less. And the more we earn, the less we give away. There's a reason that that happens. Because we fall into this trap of thinking, I'll be generous later, I'll be generous later. When I think what Paul is saying to Timothy, and what I think Paul is saying to you and me, is that we can be rich now. We can be generous now. We can be doing good deeds now. Don't wait for later. Don't wait till it's all sorted out. Don't wait till everything's where you want it to be. Be rich now. And I think it's a beautiful thing to start exercising our generosity muscle. So generosity, good deeds, sharing what you have, it only begins when we actually put it into practice, not when we reach some sort of destination where we're happy or where we are, where we think 
We are. Now, you might be sitting here going, you know what, Josh, I've been doing this for years, which is awesome. There are many people in this context and who are listening online who are percentage priority givers. I love that. One of the things that I think is really encouraging or should be encouraging to you is that when it comes to our generosity to God and to other people, when it comes to our finances, God doesn't come along to us and say, you must give X amount and say, otherwise, bad you. I think what we see from a New Testament ethic, from Jesus and Paul and those people, is being generous is actually something that we have to figure out for ourselves. So one of the things which I encourage people to do is that if you want to start to grow in your generosity, one of the things that we need to start to do is to be percentage givers. People who pick a percent of our income and say, you know what, I'm going to designate that for not me. I need to give that away. It can be to church, it can be to charity organizations, it can be to international organizations. I think the point is is that we need to go, not everything that I accumulate is for me. That's actually something I can give to other people. So pick a percentage and go, I'm going to start to say that's not for me anymore. Be directive. Um, You've walked down the shops before and you get those people in the middle come and try to get you to, you know, sign up to stuff, right? You've had that? Yeah, have any of you fallen trapped to the? Oh, it's you know, it's a good cause. They come up, oh please, you can sponsor this person. You can buy this. They come up and they go, oh here, why don't you sign up for this sort of thing? Back in the day, I used to feel so guilty when I saw those people, because what a good cause, right? Like, oh my goodness, like who doesn't want to help children over there? Who doesn't want to help those people with their education? Who doesn't want to help that situation? We all do, right? You have to be a psychopath not to want to help them. But then I always felt guilty because I just walked past them and I'd be like, <laughs> on the phone, texting. I don't know what you used to do in the olden days when you didn't have your mobile because I swear I've never seen so many people on their phones as by those booths. Everyone's got a phone call at that point. I used to feel so guilty. But when I started to practice directional percentage priority giving, I actually started to be able to walk past with confidence in those spaces and say, thank you, but not for me because I already give. I already give to Compassion. I already give to the McGrath Foundation. I already give to my local church. I already have some spaces where I get to give. So I'm saying no to that because I want to give to that. And as you feel me, I can chat to those people now and go, tell me about your cause. I love that. I hope that you come across people that resonate with that. But it's just not for me. And I don't feel guilty about that because I know that part of my income is going to certain places And I know that I've pre-committed, I've pre-decided that that's what I'm going to do. But I didn't get there overnight. I got there by just starting at a percentage, starting somewhere and just slowly increasing it. So when it comes to this idea of being rich, there's three ways that we are going to be rich um, over these next few weeks. It's through give, serve and love. Now, the origins of Be Rich actually come out of North Point Church back in 2007, and we're a partner with them through the Irresistible Churches Network, and they did this generosity campaign where they went and found local heroes in the community, organizations that, that did a lot of good stuff, and they said, how can we release funds and people hours and support into those areas? And since 2007, they have collectively, with their local churches and international partners, given away over $80 million. They've served over 560,000 hours of service in Jesus name to local communities all over the world. And so when we join in with this idea of Be Rich, this is not just LBC going, we're just doing our little part for our community, though I do believe that we're going to do a lot for our community. We're actually partnering with churches everywhere to say that we want to see Jesus' name in our community. We want to serve, we want to give, serve and love in Jesus' name and we want to partner with all these other churches that are doing the same thing. Locally here in WA, there's one other church that's being part of Be Rich this year as well. That's the Rocks Church down in Cannington, and they've got a site in Baldivis as well. Um, So in Perth, we've got these three areas covered. Um, And the idea is that we're going to give financially to a couple of not-for-profit organizations and champions. We're going to serve and that we are going to love our neighbors as well. And we're going to give you resources in how to give, how to serve, and how to to love as well. So, here's how it works. We believe that every person matters to God whether God matters to them or not. And when you think about it, it's quite a profound statement, isn't it? Before I recognized that Jesus loved me, he had already loved me. 
Before I recognized that Jesus died for me, he had already died for me. Before I even recognized that God was someone who loves, who sees me, who called me to more than just living for myself, he already, I already mattered to him, even though at the time I didn't really think that he mattered to me. So it's from this basis that we believe every person matters to God, whether God matters to them or not, that we want to do something big in our community. And the way that we're going to do that is we're going to partner with a couple of local um, organizations, and we are going to give uh, some funds to them because they're doing such good work. We're going to encourage as many of our people as we can to serve, to give up 60 to 90 minutes um, to serve, and we're going to love. I'm going to encourage you, who is your neighbor? Now, you may be thinking, Josh, my neighbor physically is it's not happening. I get that. Is there a neighbor perhaps in your workplace or socially that you could reach out to? But someone that you know in your circle of influence that you could come alongside, you could reach out to, that you could show them that they are loved and you can do something for them. Now, we're not worried about the numbers, like it's not about how much we raise or it's not about how much we serve or how many people do things for their neighbours. Um, what we actually really are trying to measure from our side as, as the staff and that is participation. So we're not worried about how much money we raise, not worried about how much hours are served. What we are worried about is does everybody have a way to participate? Can we get 100% participation in this? Now, that's a dream. Some of you this year will be going, let's see what happens and see where this lands. I get that. Some of you are early adopters, and I just mentioned generosity campaign, and you're like trying to get your bank details out. There's a spectrum, right? I get that. Some of you lean in hard. Some of you guys are like, we'll see where this goes, young man. Um, so I, I get it. <laughs> I understand. <sighs> anyway, so I, I, I get that. So what we're hoping to see is 100% engagement across, all, across this space so that you at least can engage in either giving or serving or loving this year. Hopefully that's what we start to see. We start to get those sort of stories. Now, if you want to give, um, if you want to give, we're partnering with two local not-for-profits that are making a difference in our community. We're going to, commu- we're going to partner this year with Woodland Pine Family Centre and Darling Range Hub. It used to be called Darling Range Seniors Hub, but they dropped seniors from their name, as I figured out, uh, as I learnt. Um, and I'm chatting with Yvonne uh, Fletcher and Tanya um, about how we can partner and help them. Just a little bit of background for these two organisations. Are you guys aware of Darling Range Hub and Woodland Pine Family Centre? No? They're, okay. Yeah, a couple. So these couple of organisations are doing some great work. Um, now, just to give you a bit of background on how we got to this point of wanting to support these two organisations. Uh, We went through a bit of a vetting process where we looked in our community and said, what are all the not-for-profits we have? We went through a big list of all the not-for-profits. There's a lot of Christian organisations in the hills um, and around here. Uh, Some of them are doing some some interesting things. There's there's one, uh, I don't think it's religious, but there's a not-for-profit that exists that is um, translating a DVD from some sort of Indian dialect into, into English. And that's what its whole purpose is. So anyway, this was a lot of fun to go and learn who's in the community, who's doing stuff. There is an organisation that is translating a movie. It's not even like, it's not even a religious movie or anything, or like a, a, it's just like an action movie. So I'm not really sure what, I'm very confused. I've got so many questions. Anyway, we went through and said, who's in the community? Who's kicking goals? We had a discussion. We we contacted multiple organisations. We asked uh, to meet with multiple people. Wanted to know how they're structured, what they're doing, how are they winning in our community. Had a chat to a couple of people from um, the council as well and said, hey, just from your perspective, I'm from the city, like what's happening? And um, we came out with these two at the moment. So these two are not only active in our community, but they're making a difference in our community, and we're seeing that in multiple spaces. So Woodland Pine Family Centre, uh, they run play groups, they have a three-year-old kindy, they have parenting support programs, they host special interest groups, and they also have support groups as well as a church that meets in their facility as well. They're down um, near, uh, opposite KFC down in Forestfield, uh, down there. Then you have the Darling Range Hub, Um, They have a vision to live in a community where no one grows old alone. And there's a few initiatives that they have to help with this. They do things like chair yoga, carpet bowls. They have an e-bike group, craft opportunities, sing-alongs. They do experiences like going down to the Mandra Museum. And they do so much more. They're just two local organisations, of which there are a few that are winning in our community, that with more funds could do more to help our community. Now, you may notice that neither of them are explicitly Christian um, or faith-orientated. 
the whole push behind this idea of being rich to our community is not to just support the churches. We do a lot. I mean, when you talk and put all of our churches together and the programs we run, the information we put out there, the support groups, there's actually quite a lot that happens through the churches. But we're interested in organizations, not just churches, but organizations that are making our community a better place. And this is two organizations that are doing great work in that space from the younger years through to the older years. So if you want to give to these two community champions, then we're asking you to consider this. Would you be willing to donate a one-time gift of $22.99? Now you might be thinking, why $22.99? That's one month of Netflix. So I've got a movie theme this year. That's one month of Netflix. Would you consider donating $22.99? And what we're going to do is uh, we're going to put all of our money together and we're going to go to these two organizations and say, this is from LBC. We love what you're doing in our community. This is to help you keep doing what you're doing. Now, you might be sitting thinking to yourself, $22.99, that's a little steep right now. I can give 10 bucks. Awesome, give 10 bucks. You might be there going, $22.99, I can give a little bit more. Give more. Again, the point is not the amount. The point is participation and showing our community that we don't just support them by talking about them, but we support them by wanting to see them get finance to do the good work that they're able to do. You can have a direct influence on a local not-for-profit organisation and support people in our community. Now, the next slide, um, you can chuck that one up. Um, if you want to give, uh, this is how it works. Uh, you can go and use the QR code. That just takes you to our website, which has our banking details, or you can just take the banking details. But here's the important part that matters. If you'd like to participate this year in Be Rich, and again, completely voluntary, please reference Be Rich, because if you just give the money and don't say anything, it'll go to tithes and offerings, which is great, but not also the purpose. The purpose of Be Rich is that the money will go to the organisation. So if you're sitting there and you're like, I want to support what we're doing, I want to support these two organisations, then give $22.99 or whatever amount you want to give and put the reference Be Rich. Every dollar that comes into that will go straight out to those organisations and we'll go alongside and give that to them uh, in November. So that's how you can partner with us through giving. And then finally, um, the last two ways is give, there's serve, there's love. So that's giving, $22.99, um, and give that reference, be rich. We'll give that to Woodla Pine and to Darling Ranch Hub. The other two ways is to serve. We're just asking, would you consider serving 60 to 90 minutes on a project? So we're currently um, in conversation about organising a project because it's sort of hard to say, we'd love to come and help you. How many people are coming? <laughs> 2 to 20, to 30, to 10, to 5. It's a bit of a difficult, you know what I mean, like liaising, that sort of thing. So we're going to get a time and say, can we all go, whoever's able and willing and the time works for them, can you come and serve for 60 to 90 minutes and help us with this one particular project? So that will be happening in November. And then finally, um, love, an act of kindness to your neighbour. As I said, maybe your physical neighbour is a bridge too far right now. Completely understand that, have been in that boat before where it's like, I could do an act of love and they're going to take it as an act of war. Um, so maybe there's someone in your social circle, maybe there's someone in your workplace, but we're going to get resources into your hands so that you can do something kind for the people who are in your life. And you can show them that you're not just thinking about yourself, but you're also thinking about them as well. So that's Be Rich. It is just an opportunity as a local church to take part of a bigger movement to love our community. We're going to be generous. Maybe giving is not really a space for you right now. It's serving. Amen. That's great. Do that. Maybe serving and giving are a stretch too far, but you can do some great stuff with your neighbors. Do that. The point is not the result. The point is, can you partner with being rich in good deeds to the people around you here and now? Not later. Not when you've got it all together. Not when the time's free. Not when the money's free. Can you do something now? Can you do anything now? And I think that if as a community we can be rich to those around us, we actually participate in the kingdom of God. If we say we love Jesus, if you're a Jesus follower this morning, we get to participate with God in being generous because he was first generous to us. And we want to build bridges to our community so that they can see that he is generous to them as well. Let me pray. Father God, thank you so much that you are so rich and kind and good deeds to us. Lord, help us to see in our world, in our context, how we can be rich to those around us. Help us to see how we can give, serve and love in Jesus' name.
so that our community can see that you are worth following because you are amazing. You are glorious. You provide everything that we need. Help us to use what we've been given to make the message go further. Help us to make a difference with our time, our attention, our money and our support. Help us to be rich this October. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. I really do look forward to seeing the aftermath of all of this. And I thank you so much in advance for those of you that give, love, serve in Jesus' name this Be Rich season. Thank you.